think, you know, anytime anybody says to you, I've used three photon microscopes, I think the first thing you should ask is, why? Why did you do this, right? What, what's wrong with two photon excitation? And in fact, there are a few cases where two photon excitation falls short. And I think I've got a couple of use cases here that I'll, I'll use today uh, to sort of illustrate those ideas. So one is really just Im imaging very deep into densely labeled tissue, and the other is, is imaging through a, through a scattering layer. So um, I'm going to get my, my acknowledgments in very early in case I forget later. Um, so really, all of this work has been done by a very talented postdoc, Ken and Takasaki, uh, abetted by, uh, even abetted by a few of our colleagues here at the Allen Institute. Um, okay, so what are the two projects that I want to tell you about? So, the first is really primarily an electron microscopy project. So, uh, Nuno de Costa and Clay Reed at the Allen Institute uh, are in the process of, of reconstructing a cortical column. So, this is essentially a one by one by one millimeter volume of tissue uh, where they'll have the, the complete electron microscopy reconstruction. That's a, a really big undertaking. And, um, and what they really want is to know the functional properties of every cell in that volume. Uh, and so before we, we, we perfuse the animal and form EM on this animal, uh, we need to go through and, 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 and image uh, every cell in the volume. Um, now this puts a few constraints on the experiments we're trying to do. Firstly, if it's a millimeter by a millimeter, we've got to be able to image all the way down to a millimeter below the peel surface. Secondly, if we're going to get the functional properties of every cell, then every cell in the volume needs to be labeled. So this means that we're going to have a very densely labeled tissue. Um, there's a little practical dimension. How do we go about that? Well, um, you know, we have some great reporter lines uh, at the Allen Institute. So in practice, the, 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 the strategy we're really using is to use uh, excitatory driver lines and to cross them with, with various G-camp lines um, to drive expression, at least in all of the excitatory neurons in cortex. Um, and when, you, when you're working with a prep like this, the, I think one of the really big challenges, certainly with two photon microscopy, is out of focus fluorescence. So this is something that's been known and understood for quite some time, you know, certainly from the, from the early 2000s. Um, and with two photon microscopy, as you, as you image very, very deep into the tissue, uh, you naturally have to, to increase the illumination intensity to try and maintain significant excitation in the deeper layers. And as you get down to these very deep layers, so you see down towards around about a millimeter here, um, in fact what happens is the, the intensity of illumination becomes high enough at the surface that you end up with significant excitation of these surface structures when you're trying to image deep. And with two photon microscopy, you're relying on the, on the, on the restriction of your excitation volume to, to tell you where that fluorescence comes from. So when you're imaging down here, you miss a sign the photons from the surface to these, these deep laying pixels with the result that you end up with this sort of flaring, this, this, this excess fluorescence from out of focus locations here, um, which destroys your contrast. Everything goes this sort of uniform gray and you really just can't see anything down there. That's a really big problem with, with two photon microscopy, uh, particularly in these very densely labeled tissues that we work with. And the solution is simple. You simply go to a more nonlinear form of microscopy. So instead of uh, using two photon excitation, you go to three photon excitation. And now the, the, the surface intensities are, are much lower, and you can drive significant excitation down deep. So in our hands, you can move through three, six, 900, down into white matter, and down into almost a millimeter and a half here uh, with GCAM, and get very nice contrast. You can see the contrast is kind of maintained down through all those different layers. So for anybody, I think, who's used a two-photon microscopy, this idea that you can, you can just image down well over a millimeter is, is uh, a bit of a surprise, I think. It's, just, it's not what we're used to. So, um, so to, <coughs> to give you a slightly more direct comparison, then, here we have two stacks from, um, from a single animal. So these are images of two, three, four, five, and 600 microns. But in the two-photon image, then, you can see this, this very real effect where we're, we're just losing contrast. You can see contrast is already deteriorating at 400, certainly at 500 and 600. Our contrast is largely lost, and we can really see very few cells down in those deep locations. In contrast now with three photon microscopy, you've got maintained contrast through the full depth of the tissue. You can see those cells and, and get usable data. Um, so for us, with our, with our, with our electron microscopy experiments, um, for various reasons, we decided to, to image the surface layers with two photon microscopy and then to switch over to three-photon microscopy for those deeper locations. 
So for us, one of the, the questions that came up, at what depth do we need to, to enact that switch? At what point does the, the image quality in two photon microscopy become so poor that we, that we have to switch to three photon microscopy? So our, our way to try and address that question is we, we set up our microscope to, to do simultaneous two and three photon microscopy. So we gather a, a line of two photon data, and then as the galvanometer returns in the other direction, we switch off the two photon laser, flick on the three photon laser, and gather three photon data in the, in the opposite direction. So what we end up with is, a, is an image pair where the, the two images are separated by only a millisecond, the time of a line. Um, so you can see in the superficial locations, the movies look nearly identical. But as you go down towards the deeper locations, you get nice movies, you can see cells, you can see activity, but in the two photon image, you're really lost. So what we found in practice is that this loss of contrast compromises, firstly, our ability to motion correct the movies, secondly, our ability to, to segment the cells. Uh, and really, at the point where we, where we um, well, to put it simply, if we can see those cells and we can motion correct the movies, then generally the two photon data is pretty good. At the point where the contrast becomes so poor that motion correction breaks and our segmentation breaks, then um, really there's very little we can do with the two photon data there. And for us, that break occurs about 500 microns. So we can get to about half the depth of cortex with two photon, and then we have to switch over to three photon microscopy. The other point I'll make while I'm on this slide is one of the surprises to me uh, was that actually we, we tend to use lower laser powers for three photon microscopy than two photon microscopy. I think when we started this work, I, I really had anticipated that we need to use much greater laser powers and that thermal heating was going to be a problem with three photon. In fact, we're finding that we can, we can use lower laser powers uh, than, than we would use normally with a two photon microscope. Okay, so the first thing that's wrong really with, three photo, with two photon microscopy is this out of focus fluorescence problem. And that's particularly acute in our case because we're using these very densely labeled tissues. And in practice, then, then these densely labeled tissues with GCAM6, we, we can image down to about 500 microns before we're really forced to switch over to, to three photon microscopy. Okay, so my other use case, I mentioned this idea of a scattering layer. So in fact, the, 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 uh, one of the reasons that we initially moved into three photon microscopy was to try and image through skull. So, um, so in, in my lab, we've, I think, increasingly been moving towards, um, <coughs> towards these very large fields of view. So this is, uh, so this is our, our wide field prep, where we commonly do one photon microscopy. So uh, the great thing about, about these one photon microscopes is you can have a, a, a very fast camera with a very large field view <coughs> and essentially image all of the cortical surface um, simultaneously, you know, as the animal runs along and performs behavior. Um, so this is our prep. We simply take off all the soft tissue above the skull. The skull is completely intact. We don't thin it or anything. Uh, intact skull, we put a, a thin layer of dental acrylic over that and then a cover slip. <coughs> And the cover slip serves to firstly help us to thin out the dental acrylic a little bit with, with, with downward pressure while the acrylic's still wet. But then it serves us, it gives us a, a cleanable surface. So each time we come back to, to image, we can, we can just clean away any dirt that's accumulated on the top of the prep. You can see we also have a little light shield in here. Um, generally, these mice are performing visual tasks, so we have to have a light shield to prevent light from the, from the monitor from entering our, our detectors. And then finally, we have a, a head restraint bar at the, at the back here which allows us to head restrain the mouse under the, under the microscope. So in our wide field system then, this is what our prep looks like. You can see both hemispheres, here's the midline, and we can see all the way from cerebellum up to olfactory bulb, and from temporal ridge to temporal ridge there, and, and image this activity at you know, around about 100 hertz as the, as the mouse does things. Um, so this is great, but, but one of the big problems we had was that once we've seen activity in some region of the brain, we really want to know what's happening at the cellular level there. And now we've got intact skull and a big chunk of dental acrylic, and there's really no way we can look through this with two photon microscopy. But we had a sort of reasonable expectation we might be able to see through it with three photon microscopy by shifting to those longer wavelengths where we have less scattering. We, we felt we should be able to simply look through skull. And in fact, that is the case. So this is a, a side projection um, from a fine one YFP mice. So this is a mouse with with YFP in the, in the deep laying pyramidal cells, uh, which push their, their apical dendrites up towards the peel surface of cortex here. And so you can see these dendrites pointing up to the surface. And it just so happens that collagen in bone has a very nice second harmonic signal at 1300. 
So this, in the red channel, this provides a very nice way for us to, to locate the, uh, the skull and figure out when we're at the bottom of the skull and about to start imaging into brain. So we can image clean through intact skull, and then these are simply GCAMP images from, from a couple hundred microns or so below, uh, below the bone surface. Again, in these, these densely labeled uh, mouse lines where we've got more or less every excitatory neuron labeled. And we've just popped down a few regions of interest there and can show you activity um, uh, monitored with, with GCAMP there um, through intact skull now. OK, so when we first started this project, um, one of the things we were anticipating was a big problem with aberrations. So bone, acrylic, and, and glass all have a very high refractive index, so around about 1.5. And one of, the, one of the challenges, I suppose, with three-photon microscopy is that because it's such a nonlinear form of microscopy, any aberrations, any deterioration in the focus is going to have a very severe effect on your ability to generate fluorescence. So we looked at this situation, we thought we've probably got around about three quarters of a millimeter of very high refractive index material here. Are we really going to be able to do microscopy through that? And we can, but um, anticipating that, that, that this might be a problem, we also built some, um, some aberration correction into our microscope with adaptive optics. Um, uh, that should be a movie. So one of the things that, that um, we can do now with our three photon system is to, is to use a, a deformable mirror to correct those aberrations. We can simply um, turn that correction on and off and give you some sense of, of just how, how, how much these aberrations affect the, uh, affect the, the illumination or the, uh, the excitation probability. And you can see we can, we can roughly double the amount of fluorescence that we'll get back from the tissue at a given illumination level just by correcting those aberrations through the bone. So aberration correction has some effect um, on intensity, but more importantly, it really affects resolution. So I think when we started imaging through bone, I didn't have a very good sense of how much resolution we could really expect. But as we gain more experience, and we've, we've sort of looked at these uh, dendrites and looked around for small structures like spines, uh, we've realized that we can, we can quite often resolve spines through the intact skull. Um, so here's an example with a couple of spines that we, we couldn't see in the initial condition, but once we've done aberration correction, our resolution's improved enough now that we can start to see spines. Um, here's an example with a, a spine that we could see where the intensity is, is improved and the resolution. Um, and just to sort of push that a little bit further, here's one of our spines now. This is a side view. So this is, uh, this is the z-axis here and the x-axis. So you can see the spine head is extended in the, in the optical axis, much as you'd expect. Um, and with aberration correction, it, it tightens up a little bit. And one of the reasons we've, we've looked quite carefully now at these spines is in the, in the z-axis, the spines are probably sub-resolution or near sub-resolution, which gives us a great opportunity to measure the point spread function of our microscope. Um, so if we, if we compare the, the spine head now with a, with a test bead, so this is, the, uh, again, the XZ projection for a 500 nanometer test bead. We don't really know how big the spine is, but typically we might think a spine head's somewhere around about 500 nanometers. So here's our, here's our point spread function. And it turns out our spine head really isn't that far from, from the diffraction limited resolution that we can achieve in a test slide. Leading us to think that actually our resolution through skulls is pretty close to diffraction limited. So, um, so we've really found that three photon uh, offers us, I think, surprisingly good resolution through uh, intact mouse skull. Okay, so that's our second use case, imaging through, through intact skull. Um, so I've told you about a couple of projects that, that we were working with, really very mouse-centric. But I think actually some of the opportunities in free photon microscopy are perhaps in, in other areas of neuroscience. So one of the more obvious places then perhaps is, is in larger mammals, so cats, but particularly in macaques. Um, so, so in the cat and macaque world, really two photon excitation really limits you to a, maybe just layer two, perhaps layer three of cortex. So for anybody interested in in the cortical circuit, uh, you know, two photon microscopy, I think it really doesn't cut it very well in these larger animals. You can't really see the input layer of cortex in layer four, you can't see the output layer of cortex in layer five. But I think once we, once we break into three photon microscopy now, in a realm where we can see perhaps a millimeter and a half into cortex, you can really expect to see perhaps most of the cortical circuit in these, in these large mammals. 
Um, there's another, another situation where I think free photon may also be quite transformative in these larger mammals. So in, in the macaque, uh, one of the big challenges for two-photon imaging is Jura. Jura is very thick. It's a, it's a very strong scattering layer. Um, and so for two-photon microscopy, you simply have to remove Jura. And then it, you get regrowth of the Jura, and you have to, to, have to re-clean the Jura uh, with an exposed brain surface, kind of clean away all of the, 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 uh, the connective tissue that's grown back across your prep. Um, and this happens, has to happen sort of on a regular basis. So for my colleagues who work in, in macaques, I think doing two photon microscopy is both of limited value and also extremely challenging um, from a practical <coughs> standpoint. Um, so something we've been thinking about is, is how we might also facilitate some of those, some of those tough experiments in the macaque. So with uh, Wyeth Bayer up at, at UW, we in fact took an a excised piece of macaque Jura and placed it over a test slide. So everybody has pollen grains, right? Everybody, that's everybody's favorite test slide. So we have, we tried um, macaque Jura over a pollen grain slide and also over these uh, bead slides, one micron beads. And with three photon microscopy now, we can just see clean through macaque Jura to all intents and purposes. It just seems to be transparent. So uh, I think, again, in three photon worlds, you go from this very difficult preparation to something which is, to all intents and purposes, transparent. And this is, in some respects, I think, a little bit like the, the skull in mouse, right? You have this scattering medium which completely blocks two photon excitation but you can see through it with, uh, with three photon. Um, another good example of that sort of thin scattering layer uh, comes from um, from lab with Gene Wang here in, in, uh, at UCSD. So Gene has been uh, imaging through the intact Drosophila carapace. So again, this is a preparation where, um, where the cuticle is just is opaque to two photon microscopy. Uh, it's, it's removable, but it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to remove. And with three photon microscopy now, you can just see through the cuticle and uh, into the Drosophila brain. Okay, so I've sort of, I've told you a lot about opportunities. I've told you about some of our work. I've told you about some of the other things uh, which, which people have been doing. Um, at this point, you're probably wondering a little bit about practical aspects. What do, you, what do you have to do to do three photon microscopy? And you may be wondering what the challenges and limitations are. So let me just quickly... Um, you know, run through some of the practical aspects. So I think one of the reasons three photon microscopy is, is suddenly generating a lot of interest is, is that we're seeing these turnkey laser sources. So you've just heard from, from Johan about these amplitude systems uh, lasers. Um, and I mean, I've been a little bit surprised um, at how stable these lasers have been. We've, we've been running ours for about 18 months, and the laser we've been using has, has really just required no tuning. The big contrast with the early days of two photon microscopy, where you know you spent a lot of time every day fiddling with the laser and getting it tuned up. I've been really shocked at, at how stable these three photon lasers uh, have been in our hands. So I think you know we, we really are on on the cusp of a very usable technique because we have these these uh, very stable turnkey laser sources. Um, all of the three photon microscopy uh, that we're likely to do is in this one to two micron sort of. Um, wavelength range. So it's, it's a little bit longer than two photon microscopy. And there are really two wavelengths of, of use here. At 1300, there's a dip in the water spectrum, and a second one up at 1700. So these are really the only two places you're likely to be able to do three photon microscopy, simply because water absorption is so high uh, across the rest of that spectral range. Fortunately, you see here the GCAMP, its three photon peak is right at 1300. So you know, luck would have it that there's a dip in the water spectrum at just the point where you want to excite uh, GFP and, and GCAMP indicators. It turns out also that 1700 is a great wavelength for TD tomato and a lot of the red fluorescent indicators. So we have these sort of two windows for, for uh, green and red excitation. Um, the other difference with two photon microscopy then is these lasers are typically very low repetition rate lasers. So the, the Thai sapphire lasers we were all used to using for, for two-photon microscopy, uh, with the exception of these sort of tunable systems, most of, the, most of these Thai sapphires are, are 80 megahertz systems. The, the, the three-photon systems are sort of one, two megahertz. The first four megahertz systems are now hitting the market. So that has some consequences. Firstly, it means we've got to go back to linear galvanometers and linear scanning, and it, it limits your frame rate. So for, for the work that I've been showing you, typically we're working at about eight hertz. I think that is going to change a little bit. I don't think this is really a fundamental limitation of three-photon microscopy. 
I think as we get these slightly faster repetition rate lasers, we'll, we'll start getting back into resonant galvanometers and faster imaging rates. But at least right now, uh, the imaging rates are tend to be, to be slower than we're, we're accustomed to seeing with two photon microscopy. Finally, uh, these lasers use very, very short pulses. You know, this is the only way to, to get the sort of intensities of laser power that you need in the sample. So 40 to 50 femtoseconds, you know, that's, that's uh, typically with two photon systems, we're working at 100, 150 femtoseconds, somewhere in that range. And the consequences then is you have horrible pulse dispersion in the microscope. Uh, and you simply have to do something about this. So again, as Johan has said, that compressor, he sort of emphasized the need for a compressor. This really is an essential. Either you've got to have a compressor in the laser, or you have to build a compressor yourself on the table just to deal with the dispersion. Uh, or, or really, you're going to see very little, if any, three photon excitation at all. Um, if you then want to build in um, adaptive optics, I think you have to go a step further. For the adaptive optics, your galvanometers need to be conjugate with each other and also at the back aperture of the objective. Um, that can be a problem in some microscopes. I think the scientific systems, actually, these things are all conjugate now. So it's probably a very good platform if you want to then go on to build things like adaptive optics. Um, into your microscope. Uh, but most of what I've shown you today actually was done with adap adaptive optics. I I've s heard a number of people saying, you've got to have adaptive optics if you're going to do three photon excitation. And it just isn't true. Uh, I think there's good reason to, to add adaptive optics, but we've had very good results actually with, uh, without needing to resort to adaptive optics. So in summary then, lots of opportunities. Um, there are some, some limitations. Frame rate's a little bit of a limitation right now, but I think that may change. I think something that, that's still an unknown is that I think we, we still don't quite know what the consequences are in terms of the photocipher, right? We, I think we've, as a field, we've spent a lot of time working with 80 megahertz lasers now. Um, as we go into one, two, four megahertz lasers and we change the photocycle, I think it's going to be very interesting to see um, what the consequences are for, for phototoxicity and, and um, all of the sort of the, the, the big challenges that we've, that we've faced in, in imaging. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and uh, again, thank you for the invitation to speak here today. Thank you.